all for joining us today. Uh, we're really excited to be here and kind of share a little bit about uh, quality and a little about a bit about who we are. So our talk today is going to be called Satisfaction Guaranteed, Why Quality Matters. And uh, before we jump into that, we wanted to give just a very quick background about who we are. So Celine and I are from AZ Technica. We're co-founders. We started this company at the beginning of the pandemic. So it was a strange time to start a company, but uh, here we are. It's it's actually gone smoother than we had anticipated. Um, so we are both from the quality and regulatory field. Uh, we both have post-secondary degrees in biomedical engineering, um, and we've both worked in the industry in Tucson for many years. Uh, that's actually how we originally met and uh, found our love of all things quality and regulatory. Um, we started AZ Technica to help specifically medical device companies uh, as they move through the design and development phases into post uh, production phases so that we could help uh, everybody who is trying to bring a product to market to do it in a quality manner that helps both the patients and the companies themselves. So today we're going to focus on quality, uh, but we also do a little bit of regulatory um, along with quality and, and along with design. So today we're hoping to give you a little bit of background of why quality matters and uh, when that doesn't actually happen, what are the consequences? Thank you, Megan. So I wanted to start with this quote, a satisfied customer is the best business strategy of all. How can you ensure that your customers are satisfied? What I want to take, what I want you to take away from this talk is that quality is the art of satisfying your customers. We're going to teach you guys about basic frameworks and playbooks that can help ensure that your customers are satisfied returning, giving you guys some money, and helping your business grow. The three goals that I have for this discussion is that you can describe the importance of quality to your business, identify organizations that develop and publishes international standards, and the third is to identify parts of a quality management system that are critical to your business. Again, we understand that Megan and I especially understand as entrepreneurs ourselves that there is so much information out there and there's so much to do on any given day, but we want to at least kind of like plant this seed so you guys start thinking about it and making sure that you have a very consistent business for your customers. All right, so let's start with the most obvious question. What is quality? So in its most distilled version, quality is the characteristic of a product or service that is able to satisfy the stated or implied needs, and it's a product or service that is free of deficiencies. There are tons and tons of examples that we can go into. Megan and I, our specialty, as we mentioned earlier, is medical devices. There's pharmaceuticals. I mean, there's so much. But we decided to like focus this discussion on cars because for the most part, we all have day-to-day -day interactions with our cars. And the funny thing is we all have cars that we love and we also all have cars that we hate. I chuckle because we, I have a, a Ford Edge. It's a great looking car, but its transmission has been nonstop problems and a good example of a lack of quality. The role of quality in industry. So again, keeping with the car theme, think of quality as the brakes to your system. So if you have a brand new Corvette, you might dream about like the winds blowing through your hair and everything's going great, but you have to have brakes, right? Without brakes, you have a really catastrophic joyride. So here you can think of your a, a successful and balanced business as having acceleration and brakes. The thing is, as Megan and I know, we have a tendency to over-focus on the gas pedal, on the idea of acceleration, because you might have boards advising you, you might have 
um, goals and how much you grow. You might have customers that have put maybe slightly unrealistic orders in. And heaven forbid, you need to make a living so you can pay your mortgage. You have an inherent bias towards accelerating your business. Quality and regulatory are kind of the flip side. They're the brake pedal. They force teams to slow down and to think about what they're doing. In medical devices, at one of our, the last companies that Megan and I worked for, I genuinely took pride that quality was a major line of defense for our patients. We were the internal group that said, wait, slow down. What is this going to do to our patients? Would a new material cause a uh, adverse event? Like, could you have a systemic uh, reaction to a, a material just because we didn't think it through? So we are the brake pedals. All right, now let's talk about sometimes when quality failed and sticking to our car theme, I feel like the epitome of the American car lemon is the Ford Pinto. All right, the Ford Pinto came out in 1971. U.S. automakers were starting to feel a ton of pressure from cheap, good cars coming in from Japan. So Ford decided, we're going to bust out this Pinto. It's going to be cheap. Every car for every family, 2000 bucks. However, lawsuits, lawsuits started rolling in because guess what? The car could combust. It could literally explode. Here's the funny thing. I mean, funny is a really rough word because it's tragic. Ford knew about this design flaw. In short, the, the gas tank was too close to the rear bumper, so you could have a really minor bumper tap that caused your car to blow up. They knew about it. And what really dinged them on this one is that a journalist published the risk-benefit analysis that they did and the cost-benefit analysis that showed the $11 repair versus recalling millions of cars. And Ford ended up making the decision to just let it, ro let it roll, <laughs> literally, and deal with the settlements as they came. So in the end, they did recall 1.4 million cars, but one of the, the really long-term effects of the Ford Pinto was that it left a really sour taste in consumer mouths that corporate America was willing to hurt the customer to make a buck. A more modern day, very recent, was Volkswagen, our poor, poor Volkswagen. So here in 2015, in case you didn't catch it in the news, Volkswagens had software and objectively very smart software that could figure out when the car was undergoing emission standards and optimize performance so that it would pass emissions testing with flying colors, while in reality, it was actually polluting uh, nitrogen oxide to levels that were 40 times above the allowable limits in the United States. What's interesting about the Volkswagen scandal that just un unrolled on us a few years ago was that it was the first time in 15 years that Volkswagen actually had quarterly losses and they were huge. It was a quarterly loss of $3 billion. And I will also say, so my husband and I are in like, oh, let's get a new car, you know, let's go green. And Volkswagen has some gorgeous cars, but it as a consumer, I know that this one, the fact that they knowingly made this cheat, it really soured my impression and the brand of that car. Our last example that we'll talk about, which I actually find to be a very interesting example, is Tesla. So Tesla is a gorgeous car. There is a fanboy base on the Tesla that is Bar none. It is absolutely, they cannot do any, anything wrong. What's funny though, is this car, this brand has very serious quality issues. So they currently sell four vehicles, the truck is coming, but of the four, the Model 3 is the only one that's actually currently recommended by Consumer Reports. 
And I say currently because as of three years ago, the Model 3 had very serious quality controls, quality control issues. So if you have a chance, if you have five minutes this afternoon, Google 2018 Sandy Monroe Model 3 and look at these videos. And you have to dig a little bit because I think that Sandy Monroe and Elon Musk are having some discussions nowadays. So some videos have disappeared a little bit. But one thing, so this Sandy Monroe's team, he's an engineer, he's like, decades of experience he tears down cars and he literally just videotapes tapes and talks his way through it so when he was tearing down the model three some of the things he called out were there's flaws that we'd see on a kia in the 90s i can't imagine how they released this lawyers are going to have a field day um what was interesting about this one is that he actually calls out how difficult it is to cut the power to either side and that it is plausible that the car would combust. And sure enough, we've seen that. We've seen Teslas that have caught fire. So he talks about that and the difficulty of getting out of the car. What's interesting is Elon Musk traditionally has a, a stance of being very prickly against criticism, but this one, he actually did a one-on-one -on -one interview with Sandy Monroe and mentioned that, yeah, it may not be a great idea to buy a Tesla when it's ramping up production. What I wanted to point out with Tesla is that it's interesting because it seems that it points to a consumer willingness to put up with quality issues when innovation hits the market. It is the first electric car that is also a beautiful car. Prius did a great job on the hybrid front, but a Prius, and I love Toyotas, it's not the best looking car. So they have quality issues. I would say though that the caveat is that the issues are being acknowledged by Tesla and being actively addressed. So he has the one-on-one -on -one interview where Elon Musk, I mean, like he's not out there on the production line, right? But he, he points out, yes, we're having quality issues. And yes, we're trying to figure out how to do this. All right, I know we're flying through material, but we've looked at what quality is. We looked at the role of it for your company, it's the braking system. We've looked at three automotive examples of how quality can go wrong and what that does or doesn't do for a brand. Now the question is, if there's only a playbook that would help you tackle quality issues, there it is. Here I will introduce ISO. If you've been in industry before, in almost any industry, you probably know ISO. ISO stands for the International Organization of Standardization. It's an independent, non-governmental international organization that creates industry standards. They have like something like 18,000 standards that are out there available across different, um, against different sectors of industry. What's interesting about ISO and important about ISO is that it's allowed for a very consistent playing field when we have global markets. So if I buy a pair of jeans that were fabricated in Peru versus in Indonesia versus in China, I know that a size 12 is about a size 12 across the board. Some examples of ISO standards. So like I just mentioned, ISO 8559, size designation. There's a standard for that. Uh, one that's getting a lot of attention right now is 27001, information technology and sec security techniques. So think about all of the cyber attacks that are happening, all of the discussion around patient data, patient confidentiality, and making sure that information is protected. This, this one is huge. If you are anything on medical devices, on pharmaceuticals, interfacing with healthcare, you need to be aware of ISO 27001. This one's going to be critical for you. I picked ISO 45001 because it's occupational health and safety management. So in the US, we talk about OCHA. This is like ISO's version of that. So if you have a brick and mortar where you have your customers or you have your employees and your team, this one it might be a good one for you too. A new one that's come online is ISO 26000, social responsibility. This one is if you wanna be a socially responsible company, what does that mean? And then the one that we're gonna focus on today is ISO 9001 2015 quality management systems. All right, I see, I see um, discussions coming through. 
on uh yeah i see discussions coming through if you guys want we will talk more in detail megan jump in if there's anything that needs to be addressed in real time yeah if we can yeah if you can go through the presentation and we can kind of keep it at the end that will be fantastic okay perfect thank you all right ISO 9001, 2015 is the current version. This one can be yours for the bargain price whoop, of 150 USD. So it is a Swiss company. So you see everything in Swiss francs, which is a weird designation there, but it's about 150 USD. Um, what you get for your 150 bucks is a PDF. It is really simple. Like it, it seems like they're gonna give you a binder and there's gonna be another, but it's not, it's a streamlined PDF document of what to do. So what is ISO 9001? It is a document that helps ensure that an organization can consistently provide products and services that meet customer and regulatory requirements. One of the things I wanna point out here is that it works for products and services. So for example, Megan and I started this consulting team we do not have a product that ships out in a box. We are service-based, but we actually do apply quality management principles to our company to make sure that our customers have a consistent experience with us as a consulting team. How do they communicate with us? When do we send out invoicing? How do we send out updates? How do we ask questions? How do we ensure um, that their documents are safe with us? All of those things. So again, even if you're not a product-based company, these principles still apply. And then ultimately, you're aiming to enhance customer satisfaction. Again, we're driving home the idea that customer satisfaction can lead to a successful business and that customer satisfaction is based on quality principles. So the beauty of ISO 9001 is that there are 10 sections to the document. So I like to laugh that it's quality management in 10 steps. But here's the beauty of it. The first four are all kind of like loose reference materials. So we can, for the sake of this discussion, just gray it out. And now it's become quality management in six steps. So we'll focus the rest of this discussion on those six parts. So we have leadership, planning, support, operation, performance evaluation, and improvement. All right. Section five of ISO 9001 is leadership. And one of the things they call out is making sure that your team is giving everyone the resources they need, right? So saying that you're quality first and that you're gonna do all these projects is great, but not if you only have one engineer, no money, right? So it's how committed are you to actually providing the resources to your team? Section 5.2, the one I'm gonna emphasize here is policy. So the beauty of a really good policy is that it provides a compass for your company's true north. Like what is important to your company? So Toyota has a really great quality policy. And this one I wanted to read, I'll briefly go through it. We will continuously strive to delight our customers with outstanding quality of products and services. So then they go through how they're going to talk about it. And they say, we believe our future lies in the hands of our valued customers. One thing I wanted to note is that they bookend their quality policy with mentioning their customers. So their customers come up front and they, they are the bookend of this as well. And then the repeating theme of quality throughout their, their quality policy, right? So that they're gonna have quality um, employees, they have systems, objectives, quality assurance. So here again, tying back the idea that satisfied customers and quality go hand in hand. The next section of ISO 9001 is planning. So here you have actions to address risk and opportunity, quality objectives, and planning of changes. Change this happen. Here I wanted to point out section 6.1, actions to address risk and opportunities. So most of you guys have probably had the opportunity, it's like you know, entrepreneur 101, to do a SWOT analysis where your strengths, your weaknesses, your opportunities, and your threats, right? Like Megan and I even go through that exercise. So you go through that, then what? So what action is your, going, is your company actually going to take? 
So for example, Ford identified the risk of the Ford Pinto blowing up. They knew that risk could happen and they came up with a plan. The problem was that plan didn't prioritize customer safety and arguably it was the wrong move, but that was their plan. And they, <laughs> their mistake was they documented it. Section seven, support. So support covers resources, competence, awareness, communication, and documented information. One section I really wanna hammer in is 7.2, which is competence. This is great because it stops the phenomena of people getting jobs because they're so-and-so's son or so-and-so's daughter. Your business needs experts and your business needs knowledge and very specific knowledge. Like what, what do you need to ensure your business's success? We need them to know this, this, and this, whatever those three things are. And then, so you're gonna have your, your job description, you're going to have your applicants and you're going to do the best you can to line them up. Are you going to find the perfect candidate? Hopefully, but most likely no. And that's okay, right? There, there's an understanding that there's no such thing as the perfect candidate. But what are you going to do then is actually think about, well, we needed them to be aware of um, 21 CFR pay, part 820. So that's like the code of regulations, the, the federal rule book for the United States on medical devices. That one's a big one. Like if you're a medical device company, like they need to be aware of that. If they haven't done corrective actions, maybe you say, okay, well, they haven't done corrective actions, but we're, here's their training plan. And you're gonna come up with the training plan to ensure that their competence is up to what you need it. Section eight. So section eight is really the meat and, uh, meat and potatoes when you think of like traditional production floors. So we talk, we're talking about operational planning and control, requirements for products and services, Section 8.3, design and development. I'm gonna go into that a little bit more. 8.4, externally provided processes. If you use suppliers, how do you control what they're giving you? How are you ensured that what they're supplying is actually correct? 8.5, production and service provisions, release of products and services, and then 8.7, control of non-conforming outputs. So as you can see, I wanna dive into design and development a little bit and then non-conforming. So design and development, let's go back to the Ford Pinto. Again, we talked about it, they knew about the structural design flaw. One of the very first steps in design and development is listing out user needs. Like that's the very first step that's mandated is you're gonna talk about what your user needs. It may seem super obvious to us that an implied need is that a customer does not want their car to explode. They miss that implied need does not want car to explode. And they ultimately designed a car that could explode. So you can see like, this was a very simple exercise that engineers are now taken through. It's really, really proceduralized. This is how you go through design and development. Section 8.7, non-conforming material. So nothing is perfect, right? If you have a production floor that's spitting out widgets, occasionally you're gonna have a widget that just doesn't meet the specification. Even if you have a service, there are going to be days that you just, it just didn't happen. You didn't get the email sent on time. You're late with the deliverable, things of that nature. Nothing's perfect. So for an example, going back to our car theme, theme the Model 3 that was, torn down, that was torn down had an embedded hair in the paint job. Oops. So there were actually quite a few cars that had paint job issues, the Model 3, when they were first coming out. So then it's on Tesla's uh, shoulders to like when those cars roll off the production line that they give it a check. And every time they meet, they have a car that spits off the line that has paint job issues, they need to be marking it down and starting to like make sure that they have eyes on what um, is coming off the floor and what is non-conforming, that it's not meeting the requirements. Section nine is performance evaluation. Here we're talking about really just collecting and looking at data, really starting to analyze. So section nine of quality of ISO 9001 is really where you get into the analysis part of it. So as noted, we talked about the model three that was torn down and had the embedded hair in the paint job. 
So they would document that nonconformance. Every time a nonconformance occurs, you're collecting a data point. What went wrong? What caused the nonconformance? Again, the goal here is to analyze. You're monitoring, you're measuring, you're keeping an eye on nonconformance, on nonconformances, and you're starting to look for trends. So Tesla had a problem with their paint jobs, and they ultimately adjusted cure time to ensure that quality paint jobs for their cars. We'll talk about that now in section 10. Improvement. So it seems going back to acceleration, you gotta get better, you gotta get better, you gotta get better. That's always the push with these companies, with all of our new little baby companies. So improvement, we're talking general requirements, non-conformity and corrective action, and continual improvement. So here I want to dive into section 10.2 a little bit. So up above in section eight in operations, we talked about starting to look for and document any non-conformances. In section nine, performance evaluation, we start to monitor and measure those non-conformances. So there we're starting to analyze what's going on. Now in section 10, in improvement, that's where we're really connecting the dots. Do we have a trend? Is there a root cause behind these non-conformances and how do we fix it? So in the case of the Tesla, we talked about they had, so we had this one non-conformance, which was the hair in the paint job. They start collecting and measuring the system to see how many of their cars are having paint job problems. Then in section 10, they started looking for a corrective action. And ultimately they had to adjust the cure time. And it was that small adjustment in cure time that was able to give Tesla a more consistent paint job across their cars. All right, I know we flew through that at warp speed, but I did want to, uh, we can, and Anita, this is totally up to you. We can use the chat box. We can talk as a group. How is quality important to your business? Which organization develops and publishes international standards? And this one, I'll tell you the answer because this is, that one's ISO. And ultimately, Megan and I want you to know like Google ISO, and then you can ISO pharmaceuticals, ISO medical devices, and just figure out what rule books you guys should be playing with. And then number three is which parts of the quality management systems are most critical to your business. So there we talked about six in particular. We talked about non-conformances and operations. We talked about monitoring and measuring. We talked about having corrective actions, making sure your employees are competent and you have the knowledge base that you need and things of that nature. I have a ton of resources here for you. I had more, but then my slide got really nuts. I think these are really important. Please, please, please look them up. Oh, and the nice thing here is, so 9,001 is a little bit on the expensive side, 150. If you want the, like, the cliff notes, $42, you can get the kind of the guidance content. And then here, so the playbook that Megan and I use for our business is 1345, because that's a quality management system that is specific for medical devices. And with that, we will turn it back over to you guys.